All right, it's a joy to be able to study God's Word, and I invite you to take your Bibles. Open to the Old Testament book of Genesis. On Wednesday nights, we're going to be doing a series on family, and tonight I want to talk about um, the reason for family uh, failure or fa- family conflict. And look in Genesis chapter 29. That's where I'd like for you to turn tonight. And we're going to just kind of look at a story in the life of one of the Old Testament patriarchs. While you're finding that, I want to read you a little article I uh, read in Reader's Digest says this, a substitute cheat teacher had been instructed by school officials not to let students leave the classroom except in the most dire emergencies. One morning, the substitute heard a seventh grader shriek, oh no. She ran up to the desk pleading, I have to run down to room 102 and tell my brother to eat peanut butter when he goes home for lunch today. The sub replied, surely what your brother eats for lunch is not that important. The girl said, well, Tommy has the first lunch and I have the last. If I don't tell him before he gets home to eat peanut butter, he'll eat the roast beef that mom is saving for dad's dinner. And then when dad gets home, he'll say mom has to quit her job because she didn't have time to, again, to get his dinner ready. And mom will call him a chauvinist pig and tell him to eat out again. And then he'll come home really late and mom will say she wants a divorce and she'll sleep at grandma's again. The article ends, the substitute teacher let her go. Now, we kind of laugh and giggle at that story, but, you know, family uh, strife is no laughing matter. Uh, You know, many homes today out there are war zones, and the the, the home is to be a place of peace above all all others. That's especially true for the Christian home. It's a place where God's love and kindness are to be practiced continually, Um, and yet too often homes are filled with selfishness and anger and abusive speech and even violence mark sometimes Christian homes. Someone said that a Christian home ought to be a little bit of heaven on earth, but unfortunately because of sin and selfishness, for some it's become like a hell on earth. Now family conflict is nothing new as we're going to see here. It's not a recent phenomena. It's been around since the fall of the human race. In fact, the very first family became dysfunctional, Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, and when sin entered into that home, it just destroyed everything. And what our text is going to show us here is a family at war. And it's startling when we realize that this was the family that God said he was going to use to bless all of the world. Through this family, God was going to bless everyone. This is the family from which uh, Abraham, Abraham's family, the family from which the Savior would come. And yet there was a battle raging there. And, the, and if you read this story here in Genesis 29 and Genesis 30, it kind of reads like a tennis match moving from advantage to advantage, court to court, with the opponent, one opponent trying desperately to defeat another. It's a, it's a story of irresponsibility. It's a story of selfishness. It's a story of manipulation. It's a story of sibling rivalry. It's really not a really good picture. And yet, God's grace is kind of a strong undercurrent that runs in this whole passage. Jacob, who we're going to talk about, this is really Jacob and his family. He wasn't really living in submission to the Lord at that time. And his wives were thoroughly self-centered. And yet God blesses Jacob despite all of that. He blesses Jacob with, with 11 sons and one daughter. And a 12th son will be born later. And he, all of these, will, these 12 sons will form the nation of Israel, which numbered over 2 million in Moses' day. Remember, Moses is the writer of Genesis, and he's writing to the children of Israel. Now, you might want to ask, why did Moses include this story of Jacob which is not really all that positive, why does he include this in the book of Genesis? Well, I think, first of all, it's kind of a lesson in humbling. I think it was to humble the whole nation. He was showing them that the reason that they were being blessed is not because of them, not because of their goodness, not because they were so much better than anyone else, but it was all due to the grace of God, how that God was fulfilling his promise to Abraham that through his family um, he would bless the world. But a second lesson is, you know, a lesson in God's purposes. It teaches us that man's sin cannot overcome or negate the purposes of God. Even though we may fail the Lord, God, you can rest assured, will accomplish his purposes. But also, it's, it's a lesson really for all of us to learn um, because these Old Testament stories the Bible has said are examples for us. In fact, 1 Corinthians 10, 11, now all these things happen unto them as examples. They're written for our admonition. 
And so we look at these stories, and we can learn some things from them. We can learn from some of the bad examples. We can learn from some of the good examples of things to do and things not to do. And really, the whole overall lesson we learn from this story of Jacob's family is that if we violate God's principles for the family, we're going to have conflict. We're going to have strife. We have to adhere as much as possible by the grace of God to the basic, simple principles that God has laid down in his word for family. And again, we need the help of God to do this for sure. But what I want you to see in this story are six reasons for family failure. And here's the first one. Number one, a failure to follow God's principles for marriage. What we're going to see is that Jacob's family kind of had a bad beginning. Look in chapter 29. Look down in verse number 15. And Laban, this will be Jacob's father-in-law. He was kind of a deceptive character. And Laban said unto Jacob, Because thou art my brother, shouldest thou therefore serve me for naught? Tell me what shall be thy wages. You know, just because we're relatives doesn't mean, you know, you need to serve me for free. I'll pay you. What do you want? Verse 16, And Laban had two daughters. The name of the other was Leah. The name of the younger was Rachel. Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. Now, it was customary back in that time that when you wanted to marry a girl, you would go into a a deal with the father and basically make an agreement, and that would become a contract. And uh, normally, there was some kind of price that had to be paid. You've heard me say before, I wish we still had that practice today, you know. Could have made some money off my two daughters there, but um, it got got away from me for free. Actually, I've been painting them anyway. That's another story. But um, but here in this this story here, um, there's the price is negotiated. And what is the price that Jacob said, look, I'll work seven years for your daughter, Rachel. Well, that sounded good to Laban. And uh, so he agreed. And he said in verse 19, it's better I give her to you than somebody else. So stay with me. And Jacob in verse 20 served seven years for Rachel. And they seemed unto him but, but a few days for the love he had for her. You know, not a problem because he really loved her. And it just seemed like just a few days. Well, the story from there, it doesn't (laughs) turn good. It kind of turns bad. Because in the next few verses, from verse 21 down to verse 30, it's a story about how that, you know, the wedding happens. um, There's a beautiful (laughs) wedding. But on the following day after the wedding night, uh, Jacob wakes up, and next to him in his tent is not Rachel, but it's Leah, the firstborn daughter. Now, there's a lot of questions that come to our mind when we read something like that. How could you find that out the following morning, you know? But there's a lot of different reasons for that. You know, brides wore a veil, it was dark, and so on, yada, yada. But re- regardless of how it all happened, when he wakes up, it's not Rachel next to him, it is Leah. And so Jacob, you know, says, hey, why did you deceive me? In uh, verse number 25, you know, wherefore then hast thou beguiled me, the last phrase there in verse 25. And Laban said, oh, I forgot to tell you that it ha- in our country, the custom is you have to give the, uh, you can't give the younger before the firstborn. The firstborn has to be given first. Sorry, I forgot to tell you that. So, you know, what does is, what is, uh, Jacob do? You know, he says, you know, no problem. You know, I'll just settle for what I have. No, he still wants to marry Rachel. And so they negotiate another deal. And the deal is if you'll work for seven more years, I'll go ahead and give you Rachel. In fact, I'll go ahead and give her to you now if you promise to stick around and work for seven more years. And that's what happens in the story. And so Jacob ends up with two wives instead of one. And so this is kind of bad from the beginning because if you want to have conflict in the home, you have two women in the same household that are in charge. Now you think, well, you know, this really wasn't Jacob's fault. You know, he was deceived, yeah, but he was reaping what he sowed. You remember Jacob? Remember he was a deceiver? Remember he deceived his father and so on? And now he's working for a guy who the Bible says will deceive him 10 times. What's the principle? You reap what you sow. (laughs) You deceive others, you're going to get deceived. And Jacob here meets his match. But now whatever the reason for it, however it all fell out, one thing we know of is this is not according to God's intention for marriage. What was God's plan for marriage the Bible is very clear on that. One man, one woman. In fact, in the very first marriage in the Bible, we see there are only three participants. That's God, there's Adam, and there's Eve. And that's the three participants in marriage. God is the originator 
of marriage. It all comes from God. This is the way he made it from the beginning. God made Adam and gave one wife, Eve. God didn't make a harem of women and say, you can have as many as you want. Uh, it was one man, one woman. In Genesis 1.27, it says at the beginning, he made them male and female. And this is in the emphatic position in the Hebrew. In other words, all this was of God. Marriage is an institution of God, not man. God is the one who designed it. Therefore, God is the one who defines it. It's not defined by the Supreme Court. It's not defined by the state laws. It's defined by Almighty God. God is the inventor of marriage. And God said it's between a man and a woman. Anything outside of that, it, it, it's not real. It's not a real marriage, you know. Uh, it doesn't matter how many states try to legalize homosexual marriage. It's not moral. It's not of God. And it's not what the Bible says about marriage. God's principle for marriage is one man, one woman, together for life until death do you part. And this whole story illustrates the potential problem that a man has when that's not the case, or or, a problem a family has when anything spoils that design that God had for it. And part of the reason that God's plan for marriage is wrecked or spoiled is because of the sinfulness of man, because we want to do it our way, or we want to do it in different ways. And not long after Genesis 1, what you find in Genesis is polygamy. The first polygamist was Lamech in Genesis 4, 23. He was a rebel. He was a murderer. And next you have Abraham listening to the voice of his wife, Sarah, which is almost an echo of Adam listening to Eve in the Garden of Eden to disobey the Lord's admonition. And then Esau marries two women and takes a third. And then now we see here a case of polygamy with Jacob. And then later, the Hebrew kings in the Old Testament, we find that they are also polygamous. But their marriages and their homes were catastrophes. If you read that in the Bible, you'll find out that they were a wreck. Their homes were a mess. Because when you don't follow God's plan, what's laid down in Scripture, you're going to have conflict. You know, God has given us in Scripture some basic principles to follow for our home, and we, by the grace of God, simply have to follow those principles. And again, I say by the grace of God because we can't do it on our own, right? We need the help of God. We need to constantly ask God for that help. I know of a pastor friend of mine who had a son, and he came to his father one day and showed him a drawing of a horse, and the pastor thought, well, this, man, I have a wonderful artist for a son. Man, he's gifted. And he said, son, show me how you drew this this horse. And he said, sure, Dad. And he went and pulled an encyclopedia off the shelf, opened it up to a horse, and laid the paper down and traced it. The pastor realized, I don't have, an, <laughs> I don't have a, a genius artist after all. Um, uh, and it, you know, but you know, the truth of the matter is, your marriage and home can be a masterpiece by simply following the pattern that is already laid out in Scripture, by following what God says. And it doesn't happen that way. But there's a second failure here. There's a failure of the husband to love his wife. One thing leads to another. And look in chapter 29, verse 31. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And so basically, Jacob hates Leah. And the word for hate here is kind of in the relative sense. It means that she was unloved. Jacob didn't love Leah. It's very evident to her. She didn't feel loved. She didn't feel valuable. She felt neglected. She felt hated. She was a frustrated wife trying to earn the love of her husband, trying to learn the respect of her husband, and she's feeling as if she never got it. And so she must have been a very unhappy woman in this relationship. We kind of get that idea here. And again, there's a basic principle that God gives all of us as husbands, men. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church. A husband is not to love his wife, um, only to love his wife, I should say, but he is to express that love the way Christ expressed his love to us. It goes on to say in Ephesians 5, 29, for no one yet hated his own flesh but nourished and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. It's wrong for a wife to have to seek or to earn something from her husband that he should be giving to her freely. A wife shouldn't have to feel like she needs to earn love from her husband. And yet, this is how Leah feels. That's not how Christ loves us. He loves us freely. He loves us Um, unconditionally um, as we are his children. But we see here that God kind of takes up for Leah 
And the Bible says God honors her because God gives her the ability to bear children. At the same time, Rachel, her, her ability is taken away. So it's almost like God comes to the side of this mistreated wife. And what we see here in verses 31 down to verse 35 is Leah bearing children for her husband. And we can kind of see a little bit of what she's going through, the emotions that she's feeling by the names that she gives her children. One commentator, Armstrong, said, we see the depths of Leah's pain in the names that she gives to her children. So notice in verse number 32, and Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben. Uh, Reuben sounds very much like he has seen my misery. It's the Hebrew word that means, um, or, or it sounds just like that. And she creatively, you know, kind of shortens or condenses it. The Lord has seen, and then uh, the, another part of a Hebrew word, which means my husband will love me. And so uh, she says here in verse 32, surely the Lord has looked upon my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. And so she was obviously a woman who was in misery because she didn't feel like she was loved. And again, men, that's our role as husbands. We have to love our wives and make sure that they feel loved and respected. Yet God is gracious to Leah, and uh, God watches over. That's really kind of the point here. I think God is always gracious and protective of a wife who's treated unfairly by her husband. But then notice in verse 33, and Leah conceived and bare, uh, or, uh, and she conceived again and bare a son, and said, because the Lord has heard that I was hated, he has therefore given me this son also, and she called his name Simeon. Now, again, this is very interesting here. The name that she chooses is a combination, again, of two Hebrew words, Sama, the Lord has heard, and then Senua, I'm hated. And one Jewish scholar says the names of Leah's first two sons replicate a pair of verbs, to see and to hear, that expresses God's providential concern over her. God hears, God sees what she's going through, and uh, she felt hated, but now she's thinking, you know, maybe this second son will help. And um, But she saw this was God's response to her misery that she was having. And then she has a, another child, notice verse 34, and she conceived again and bare a son, and said, now this time will my husband be joined unto me because I have borne him three sons, therefore his name was called Levi. And the name Levi means attached or joined. She's basically saying, now my husband will be Levi to me. He will be attached to me because um, I've given him a third son. But her hope is not realized. It doesn't happen. Still, she's not loved and so, therefore, in verse number 35, she conceived again and bare a son, and she said, now will I praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah and left bearing. The word Judah simply means praise. I will praise the Lord. And it's almost like when she has this fourth son, she finally realizes that really the only fulfillment in her life that she's going to receive is going to be with her relationship to God. She needs to find her happiness and joy in God and that relationship with the Lord. And so she basically says, I will praise the Lord. And so she finally understood that bearing children is not going to really change her husband's attitude towards her. And, you know, she, she focuses on the Lord for a time. Now, she might slip back a little bit later on as this sibling rivalry begins to pick up. But here, at least at this point in her life, she understands that God is on her side and that God is the source of her happiness. And that's really a good lesson for us, isn't it? We have to find our sense of self-worth and satisfaction and joy, not from our relationships horizontal, but from our relationship first with God. We have to find that joy and happiness and satisfaction in knowing him. And when we have that right, you know what? I find out that these horizontal relationships will work themselves out. If I learn to find my joy and my peace and my satisfaction first and foremost in God. And so she kind of comes to that place in her life. And then the Bible says she ceases from bearing here. So, and by the way, um, God not only blesses her by giving her children, but also he blesses her in this way. From Judah came the institution of what in the Bible? Kingship. From Judah will come kingship. From Levi came the what? Came the priesthood, right? 
So two of the most important Old Testament institutions have their origins in this marriage from a woman who felt hated and she felt unwanted, and yet God blesses her. And uh, later, through the line of Judah, who would come? The Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Savior. And so she may have been unwanted and despised by her husband, but she was uniquely blessed by Almighty God. So what causes conflict? There was a failure to follow God's principles for marriage. We see here a failure of a husband to love his wife. But then here's number three. There's a failure of fathers to give spiritual leadership in the home. And this is so important that faithful fathers be leaders. It's necessary for a stable home. Faithful fathers must understand and undertake their role, their role as the Bible teaches us in the Word of God, uh, what it tell, tells us in the Scripture. And I think the moral breakdown in American society is due in large measure to the failure of fathers to assume their God-given role. And we're seeing that breakdown. Dr. Melvin Worthington said this, there is no adequate substitute in the home for a strong and spiritual father. The father ought to do his uh, hu- ought to do for his human family what our heavenly father does for his family. Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will what? We're going to serve the Lord. He took his responsibility for his family and their future seriously. That's not what Jacob did. Because look in chapter 30, verse 1, and when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, give me children or else I die. She was so jealous over Leah And of course, in Hebrew culture, you know that it was a shame to be barren, unable to give your husband children. Everything revolved around that. Did you have, you know, children, especially sons, people that can pass on the family name that could work and labor and be your helper and provider in years to come? Uh, To not be able to bear your, your husband children was a tremendous stigma associated with a woman. And so here she blames her husband. You know, give me children or I die. And Jacob, in response, makes several mistakes. How many of you men know that it's important how we respond to our wives? You know, we respond in the right way. But what we see here is, first of all, he was proud. He doesn't recognize any, any role in this. He doesn't recognize the fact that the reason maybe that God is get, not giving Rachel children is because of his attitude towards what's happened in his life. He's angry. He refuses to take any responsibility. The Bible says God actually closed Rachel's womb, I think, because of Jacob's attitude. And it seems like everyone around could see this except Jacob himself. And so in verse 30, or or verse 2, excuse me, of chapter 30, and Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel, and he said, Am I in God's stead who hath withheld from thee the fruit of thy womb? And so, you know, he gets angry, he gets defensive. Um, In fact, you know, we could say this then Jacob's anger burned. And the word anger here literally means to breathe hard, to be enraged. This is a rage. He, he kind of flies into a rage. And uh, I mean, he was steaming. And his reply seems to be implying, look, it's not my fault. You're the one who can't have children. Don't get mad at me. Go after God. I have children everywhere. It's, it's not me. Um, and so he was kind of proud in the way he responded. But also we see that he was prayerless. He didn't really pray. He didn't go to God for a solution. He didn't say, you know, you're, let's pray. Let's seek the Lord. Let's, let's, let's get God's favor. It was really a time to pray together. You know, when you have a family difficulty and a conflict and a crisis, you know the best thing to do is to pray together. Say, God, help us. We, we need your help in this time. After all, he's the one that's in control. He's the one that can change things, you know, But instead, you know, he doesn't pray. He doesn't seek the Lord. Why? Because he's not walking with the Lord. He's not seeking God's face at this time in his life. And I want to tell you this, men, if you're not seeking the Lord, if you're not walking with God the way you should, guess what? Conflicts are going to arise. We have to be an example in our home. We have to walk with God. Jacob's not submitted to the Lord. He's angry instead. And he's also passive. You know, he doesn't really do anything. And Rachel comes up with her own scheme rather than trusting God. And so basically in verse 3, she said, Behold, my handmaid Bilhah, go in unto her, and she shall bear upon my knees that I may also have children by her. So this was kind of the solution in that day. You know, if a wife couldn't give her husband children, one of the cultural things to do was if you had a handmaid 
or a servant girl for the wife to offer the husband this servant girl, and then she would have a child. And when it came time for her to deliver the child, I know it sounds kind of crazy, but this, the, the, the mother, the wife, would actually lay underneath the woman having the baby. And so actually when the baby came out of the mom's womb, it, the, it was almost like she was there, there actually bearing the child. I know that sounds crazy, but that's what it means when it says in verse number four, and she shall bear upon my knees that I may also have children by her. It was kind of a surrogate motherhood here, a way to, um, to have someone else give a child to you know, your husband is have someone else have that child, but you're there almost as if you're doing it. Now, this is nothing new because uh, Jacob surely knew the story of his grandmother, Sarah, when Abraham couldn't have a child and God promised that they would, rather than t- waiting and trusting God, Sarah takes matters in her own hands and says, you know, here's Hagar, have a child through her. And that also caused problems in the, in the, in the home. I mean, Jacob could have stepped in and said, now, wait a minute. I remember grandma did this. It didn't go well. You know, it might have been culturally acceptable to do that in that day, but it wasn't really what God wanted. And God calls it sin. But, but Jacob, he goes along with it. You know, he's very passive. He's a pragmatist. He's willing to buy into the immediate short-term solution and forget about the long-range consequences. And so he passively buys into this immediate solution. And so, um, and so that's what happens here. And so Rachel was hoping to build a family through Bilhah. And then, so a child is given in verse 5, and Bilhah conceived and bare Jacob a son. And Rachel said, God has judged me and hath also heard my voice and hath given me a son. Therefore, she called his name Dan, which means he is vindicated, because Rachel viewed this birth as a divine vindication of her scheme, which isn't really true. You know, and then there's another child that comes along. She bears a second son. And uh, in verse 7, And Bilhah, Rachel's maid, conceived again and bare Jacob a second son. And Rachel said, With great wrestlings have I wrestled with my sister, and I have prevailed. And she called his name Naphtali, which means my struggle. She felt like, you know, finally I'm getting a, a, you know, over up on my sister. You know, I'm able now to do this. And it kind of shows you her heart. Really, the Hebrew reads struggles of God. It's better translated in struggling with God. I have struggled with my sister, you know. Really, her problem was with God. She's struggling against things in her own life. She's struggling with God. You know, she's kind of angry against the Lord. You can almost hear the anger in her voice. And you almost see this sibling rivalry breaking out. You know, God still hasn't given Rachel a child of her own. And, uh, and so what happens now is that, you know, uh, it, it even intensifies because, and here's the, the next principle I see in this whole story. Not only is there a failure, a failure to follow God's principle for marriage and a failure for a husband to love his wife and a failure of fathers to give spiritual leadership in the home. Jacob's not giving any leadership in this whole situation and it's spinning out of control, but there's a failure to put aside a me first attitude. Now it's just all about being me and what's best for me and selfishness. And I want to tell you, if there's anything that destroys a family, it's selfishness. Me first attitude. That'll, that'll create conflict in any home. And so there's a war that kind of breaks out now because look down in verse 9. And when Leah saw that she left off bearing, she took Zilpah, her maid, and gave her to Jacob, her wife. Uh, you know, she didn't need to do that. But now it's a rivalry about who can give the most children, you know. And so there's this war that breaks out between Rachel and Leah. There's this sibling rivalry here. Leah is not about to let Rachel get the final word. And so she is determined to stay ahead of her sister. And since Rachel now has two surrogate children, she's going to give another one. And so basically um, Jacob has another child through uh, Leah's servant maid and um, and, and the Bible tells us here in verse number 11 uh, that, um, and Zilpah, verse 10, Zilpah, Leah's maid, bear Jacob a son. And Leah said, a troop cometh. And she called his name Gad. Um, you know, so actually Gad means good fortune or good luck, you know, really is what it means. What a good fortune. She's thinking, man, I'm a lucky lady. Fortune has come to me. 
And, um, and so now, you know, she said, I'm going to name him Gad. And so, again, there's this, there's this rivalry that breaks out. And I think if I'm counting right, the score is four to two in favor of uh, Leah. Or no, it's five to two, right? Five to two. <laughs> Hard to keep up. Uh, four to two. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's about to be five because in verse number 12, 13, um, and Leah, and verse 12, and Zilpha, Leah's maid bear Jacob a second son. And Leah said, happy am I, for the daughters will call me blessed. And she called his name Asher, which means blessed. Women will call me happy. This is Leah saying, boy, I'm going to be envied. You know, now I'm able to give another child to my husband. And, um, but this happiness is going to be shallow and temporary. It really lies in success over her sister. And, um, and so what you see, again, is just this rivalry, this, this, this breaking out because of this me-first attitude that's happening in the home. And again, we have these women focusing on themselves, pleasing themselves. They're not focused on the Lord. God is not in the center. Jacob is not giving spiritual leadership. And, and the home is a mess here because of this selfishness, this me-first attitude that's just destroying the home. I heard about a mother who's preparing pancakes for her sons, Kevin 5 and Brian 3, and the boys begin to argue over who would get the first pancake. And the mother saw this as an opportunity to teach a nice spiritual lesson, and she said, if Jesus were here, he would say, let my brother have the first pancake. I, I can wait. And Kevin turned to his younger brother and said, Ryan, you be Jesus. Well, the truth is we need to be Jesus in our home, and we need to put others first. And then number five, uh, there's a failure to depend upon God instead of our own foolish schemes or devices. Because what happens now in verse number 14 and 16, and we'll just keep this short, is that basically, um, you know, it says in verse 14, And Reuben went out in the days of wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field and brought them unto his mother, Leah. And Rachel sees that in verse number 14, and she says, you know, give me those, your son's mandrakes. And verse 15, and she said unto her, is it a small matter that thou takest my husband, and what is thou take away my son's mandrakes also? And so basically, you say, what were mandrakes? They were these little uh, plants that bear this, this little flower in the winter and this plum-sized fruit in the summer. And in ancient times, it was kind of a superstitious that a superstition that, you know, it would produce children if you had these mandrakes or you ate mandrakes, you know. Kind of one of those superstitious things, you know. Uh, one of those home remedies, you know. Reminds me of the story my mother told me once. You know, when she was a little girl, she had a lot of freckles. And people, kids in the school made fun of her. But she heard this story. She lived out in Western Maryland. She grew up on a dairy farm. And uh, she heard this story that if you go to a, an old tree stump, hollowed out tree stump that's filled with water. And if at nighttime you go there and you wash your face in that water, the next morning your freckles will be gone. <laughs> so she decided to do that. You know, she washed her face in that water. And she was, she was so disappointed when she got up the next morning and looked in the mirror. She still had all those freckles. Matter of fact, she said she looked like she had more. Um, that's kind of what this is. This is old superstition, you know, these, the, you know this certain thing here. And so they barter, you know, Leah barters with Rachel for it. And, you know, what we see here basically is, basically Rachel is not really looking to the Lord for help in her situation. She's just trying to figure out all of her own ideas and superstitions. Sometimes people ask me, you know, is it wrong to do things to, for people to have to? No, listen, medical science today is a common grace from God that can help families with this area of bearing children. There's nothing wrong with seeking that kind of help. That doesn't mean you're not depending on God. God uses means to accomplish his ends. But ultimately, we have to look to the Lord. Ultimately, we have to depend upon God. And that's what Rachel's not doing. Finally, however, she does come to a point where she does seek the Lord. In verse number 17, and God hearkened or excuse me, that's Leah there still. She hearkened to Leah, gives him a fifth son. Um, but then down in verse number 22 is where I want to get. And God remembered Rachel, and God hearkened to her, and opened her womb, and she conceived and bare a son, 
And she, she said, God has taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph and said, the Lord will add to me another son. And so, and then, you know, of course, Le- Leah will pro- provide another son uh, to Jacob as well. But what we see here is that, again, uh, this, this selfishness, this lack of dependence upon the Lord, finally learning to, to look to the Lord and trust in God, and uh, that's what God wants. He wants us to put our trust in him. And when we have conflicts and difficulties, to go to him and seek his face because God is there to help us through these difficult times. Don't depend upon your own foolish, you know, scheming. Ultimately, look to the Lord for wisdom and direction and help. And that's ultimately what God will honor. By the way, uh, Al, Gardengi, Al Gardengi gave me an interesting article about this whole situation, about the culture back then. Rachel didn't have her first uh, child until after seven years. And um, some think that the culture back then was, you know, even if you make an agreement for marriage, you're not supposed to have children until after you fulfill the terms of the agreement. And since Jacob uh, fulfilled it, you know, basically in the contracts that'll work for seven years, Rachel doesn't have a child until after seven years. So maybe that was God keeping Jacob honest before he had Joseph fulfilling the terms of the covenant. That's an interesting article, Al, that talked about that. I'm not sure how much that works out in here. There's some legitimacy in that. But ultimately, God is in control over all of these things. And then let me just, uh, let me just give you one final thing, and we'll be done here. There was a failure also to be content with your circumstances. Because even though God does give Rachel the desire of her heart, it just seems like it wasn't enough that she, she wanted more. And, um, and, and basically, that's, that's kind of the way it, we see it in the name of Joseph in verse 22 and verse 23, um, where Joseph may, means, may he add, and her prayer was, may the Lord give me more. You know, God honored her, gave her a, a son, but may he add to me and take away my reproach. That's kind of the name there. And God will give her another son, but in doing so, he will take her because she will die. And uh, also, Joseph will be taken away only later to be added. So there's kind of like a prophetic element here in the name of Joseph. But she's not really content with what God has given her. I mean, she's still behind nine to three. You know, I really believe that when we're not content with what God is doing in our life, it opens up all kinds of problems and temptations in our life. You know, remember when Joseph, or excuse me, when David committed sin with Bathsheba and God sent Nathan the prophet and God basically said, you know, look, I've given you all these things, but that wasn't enough. What I've given you wasn't enough. And if you really look at what Nathan said, that whole narrative there, it gives you the root of really what caused David to do what he did. He wasn't content with all what God had already given him. It was greed and selfishness in his heart that felt like he should get more. And that lack of contentment opened up a door of temptation. You know, sometimes I hear Christians say, boy, if I only had this, if I only had that, if I only had a better wife or better husband or a better job or more money or a newer house, if I only had nicer furniture so on. The Bible says godliness with contentment is great gain. And we need to learn to be grateful for what God gives us and content with what we have, because if we're not content with what we have, we're not going to be content with what we get. Contentment is not based on possessions. It's a heart issue. It's an inward heart issue. And so in, in closing here, what caused this conflict? a failure to follow God's principles for marriage, failure to, for a husband to love his wife, failure to give spiritual leadership in the home, failure to put aside a me-first attitude, failure to depend upon God instead of your own scheming, a failure to be content with what God gives you, and so on. You say, what's the application for us? Well, it's very simple. Determine that we're going to follow God's plan. You say, man, I I feel like I made a mess of things. You know what? God is so gracious. He's able to make up the years that the locusts have eaten. If we just give our brokenness and our mess to the Lord, you know, God is able to straighten things out for us. 
And what he wants for us is just a a heart determined to follow his way with his help and his grace. Love your spouse. Love your children. Be selfless. Put others first. Be content with what God gives. And when there's a conflict, look to the Lord. Seek God's face and pray together. And if God doesn't give you an answer quickly, it's because God wants to develop your prayer life and faith more. You just keep praying, and you keep seeking the Lord, and you trust him, and guess what? You're going to see God work. And I think, you know, this is, these are, again, things that we can learn from this whole situation. And let me also say, when family conflict comes, I always, you know, when I'm counseling, I always say, you know, learn to say three phrases. I'm sorry, I was wrong, please forgive me. You know how much that will rescue you from difficulty in the home? I'm sorry, I was wrong, please forgive me. So I want everyone to say that. I'm sorry, I was wrong, please forgive me. Some of you are not saying it. But you you get the idea. You know, we're all sinners trying to live together. And we need the grace of God. We need the help of God. Let's, Let's bow for prayer tonight. Father, uh, we just kind of skimmed through this story here. There's so much more here. We just wanted to take a, a quick look at it because, Lord, these stories are here. They're recorded not just to take up space but to give us instruction. And what we realize is the heart of man has not really changed. What, what we see today it's, it goes all the way back to the beginning. The heart, the problem of the human heart is the heart of the problem, and it's sin, it's selfishness. And, Lord, we need to be delivered from ourselves. The biggest problem I have is the person I look at in the mirror. And, Lord, I need your grace. I need your help in every area of my life. I need to look to you. And, Lord, as we try to be all that you called us to be, we ask you for your help. Help us, Lord, by your grace to follow your principles. We want to have a home that honors you. We want our children to reach out and and to know you and to love you. So help us, Lord, to be an example ourselves. May we walk in your way. May we seek your face. And when conflicts come, may we learn to lay aside our pride, that abominable pride that's in all of us, to humble ourselves and seek your face. Lord, we need that. And so, Lord, bless these words to our hearts tonight and bless these families that are here. May you... May, Lord, you just work mightily with your grace in every home and in every life. For your honor and your glory, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.